our prayers, your word, and our, uh, our commitment to you, Lord, would be pleasing in your sight. And be with us today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you will, stand and let's be called to worship this morning. Unless the Lord builds the house, its builders will have toiled in vain. Unless the Lord keeps watch over a city, in vain the watchman stands guard. Our help is in the name of the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. Let us worship God. Please remain standing and we will begin our music service this morning. Thank you. 
Well, this is a time in our, uh, in our service that we honor our Christian duty as, as followers and those forgiven by Christ, that we go and bring our prayers of confession before Him. Uh, we all fall short of the mark, so um, let us go now uh, in confession and pardon. Let us pray together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, help us to examine our hearts with honesty and to see more clearly the things that enslave us, for we can be so repentant about trifling sins, so sorry for the small, foolish sins, and yet so utterly blind to our real sins the cavalier way in which we overlook the injustices from which others suffer, but from which we ourselves are mercifully free, the casualness with which we use others for our own ends, the classification of people as those who are good to know and those who are not good to know, above all, the failure to feel for all who are persecuted and tyrannized at home and around the world. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. The Apostle John writes in his first epistle, chapter 1, verse 9, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. As you now confess your sins before Almighty God, receive His forgiveness and rejoice that you have been purified and in this moment into righteousness. Hallelujah, we are forgiven. Amen. Well, let us continue in our time of prayer, this time that we call prayers of the people, and this is where we bring before God the concerns of our hearts, the praises that we owe Him, and, and the things that, frankly, we just, we just need to ask God's help in. So let us go now and, and bring our prayers before the Almighty God. Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we are so grateful, as we said earlier, that You, the, the Creator of the universe and, and uh, the Sovereign Lord over all creation, would hear each of our individual prayers. No matter how big, how small they are, Lord, we know that we, we are, are much, much smaller than you, but you hear our prayers nonetheless. Father, thank you that you have sent your Son that bridges that gap between our, our former selves who were lost in sin and, and Father, yourself who cannot even look on sin. Thank you, Father, that, that we, through Christ, can come to you with any and everything that is going on in our life. Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, we do lift up Tom Campbell and Robin Gregg, and we pray, Lord, that you would uh, just heal them, help them to recover from the surgeries that they have undergone, and, and Father, that you would give them full recovery and freedom from pain. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, 
Lord, we do pray for, for traveling mercies, and God, we just pray that, uh, that, they would, that they would know Christ is with them during this trip. Lord, give them protection and uh, a good time when, as they are with their family. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, we do give you, we do give you praise that that uh, Ashley is here and and that uh, her her medical condition was um, actually in perfect timing for you, Lord, that you could get her help and, and that she would be with her family. Uh, we pray, Lord, that she would uh, recover quickly, that you would take care of her and heal her, and Lord, that through this through this ordeal, that she would grow closer to you and know you as her healing father. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, we do, we do give you um, great praise for being able to uh, use Susie as your instrument to speak truth to Elliot and that, that this may be a, that may be a life-changing moment for him. Father, thank you that, that you put your disciples right where you need them and you give them the words that need to be heard. Father, speak, speak to Elliot's heart and and God, we just pray that you continue to, uh, to strengthen us all. Give us all the courage to do as Susie has done, to, to speak life into another's heart. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Well, we do ask for, for uh, safe travels for Doug as he goes to Michigan this week. We pray that his, uh, his journey up there will be trouble-free and that his time up there with his mother will be, will be very special. We'll be with him and, and, and just help this to, to be a blessed time for him. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Father, as always, we do, uh, we give you praise. We give you praise for this beautiful day, for this beautiful weather that you have blessed us with this spring. Lord, it's so refreshing to step outside and, and see all the green. And, and Lord, even though it, uh, it causes us to do a little more work outside, it's probably good for us that we get out and get the fresh air and get, to get our muscles moving. God, thank you for, for this spring weather and, and for the rains that have come and and Father, just the way you, you make these things perfect for us every year. Um, Lord, we just pray for the ones who, who can't be with us today. We pray, Lord, that they would be uh, blessed by our prayers for them here. Uh, we pray, Lord, that they might uh, worship with us on the, on the uh, digital format later when, it, when it's up there. And, and Father, that they might feel as much a part of, of this congregation as they ever have. And, and Lord, we so look forward. Uh, to your hand being on this world to to rid us of this uh, horrible virus that we've been through and God that you would just uh, heal this land make it possible for your for your people to to come together and be a community and a, and a family once again God we pray for the ones who are at risk out there today the ones who are 
are uh, putting their lives on the line to keep us safe and healthy. All the healthcare workers and the emergency workers and police, firemen, military. Lord, we always lift them up in prayer and, and ask that your, your grace and your mercy would be with them as they, as they do this job that they've been called to do. Uh, Father, we pray that now as we go into a time of, of hearing your word, uh, Lord, that you would uh, open our hearts that we might receive what you have for us today, that we, that we might uh, learn and, and walk out of here changed from the way we walked in. And Father, hear our prayers now as we lift them as one voice, praying the way Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to invite Pastor Rick up to bring us our message today. Thank you. Thank you for that beautiful music. Wow. I love learning new hymns, new songs. And uh, sometimes, you know, we were talking the, uh, the other week about how it's easy to get comfortable. And we miss some of the things that we could be taking advantage of. And uh, new music, um, new hymns. I, thank you, Jim. Thank you for everything. Good to see everybody. Good to see everybody, some opportunity to, to share with what's going on in our lives and our hearts, and uh, it's just good to be with you. So here's what's happened. We've been going over to gather some of the commands in Scripture. That There's 59 of them, one another commands. And we've talked about love one another, encourage one another, serve one another, forgive one another. We're going to continue this journey for a few more Sundays. I think it's really important, as I share with you, um, the first time I ever saw anything like this was when I was in seminary many years ago, and uh, a couple of books had come out about these reciprocal commands. And what they really do is they're given to us to model what it means to be the body of Christ in the world. And so it's really important, I think, that we remind ourselves of what Christ has called us to do, particularly in times like we're going through right now. So, and it's interesting when we, when we go through them, um, these passages, it shouldn't surprise us that there are encouragements to unity, to fellowship, to bonding, to, to harmony. And such is the case. The passage we're going to look at, just real briefly, and some other ones, uh, the one on which our message is based is Romans 12, 16. Paul, ur it's real short. Paul urges us to live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. We just read that in our, compa in our confession prayer. Uh, and we're going to be talking about that, how it's so easy for us sometimes to be close to those that are like us or that we have any stuff in common. But that's, uh, that's not what, and a lot of other passages give us this same idea of living in harmony. So I want us to look at an illustration. I, I saw this and I thought this is going to be kind of neat for, for us to, to hear that. And because um, there's an application there. So it's, uh, see what you think.
that all about you may be asking <laughs> what in the thunder well here, here's what it is there are certain sounds in music they're called notes and we could come up with you remember anybody ever learned to play panic bling 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 what was that called chopsticks, chopsticks. I still can't play it after 70 years and so we have these single notes, and they're okay, and there's simple sounds that, and, and songs that we can create with single notes, and it's okay. But there are some sounds, some music, some that, that can't be played with just simple notes like that, that boom, boom, boom. They can only be played when multiple notes and multiple sounds are, are put together. Now follow me. There's a point here. Then, when we get lots of notes, like the second time it went through, you heard the background and everything, and it's a little bit nicer to hear. It's called harmony. Another bunch of notes were brought together to create the desired sound. Now, here's a question for some of us older folks, maybe. Who do you, even younger, I, I should include everybody, excuse me, I shouldn't just talk about the old folks. Who were the groups that you remember growing up that specialized in harmony? The Beatles. The Beatles? Yeah, they were pretty. Uh, they were pretty good. Simon and Garfunkel. Simon and Garfunkel who? Fifth Do you the Fifth Dimension? Man. Bam, bam, bam. Anyway, yes. Uh, how about? Do you remember the Four Tops? Ding, 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 ding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, yeah so you, you get the idea. There were some groups. Mamas and the Papas, do you remember them? Yeah, yeah. The Beach Boys. I was waiting for that. He gets an extra bag of coffee for that. <laughs> yes, yeah. These folks, and now how about some, who are some younger groups now that, that are good at harmony? Tell us, because I don't know who they are today. Okay. Pantatonics. I thought that was something you'd see at Lowe's with the no Emma. Anyway, the point is single notes, yeah, but when you bring harmony and many notes together, and let me tell you something, it's not easy to do that, to put all these musical tones together. But there's some people and that's how these these groups you know, were, were known and made their, made their impact. So, um, and let me tell you something. It's not easy to make harmony with music. Are you ready for this? And it's not easy to have harmony all the time within the church. Oh, shock and awe, right? That's what we're going to be talking about. It's Harmony is just not simple, even for God's people. Um, we were talking back in February when we were talking about encouraging one another, and there was this row or fight between Paul and Barnabas. Remember the story? Barnabas wanted to take John Mark with him to the journey, and Paul said, "New, no, but he knew. He dumped, he dumped, he walked away from us. Uh, 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 not going to happen. So Paul takes Titus. But Barnabas takes John Mark, and John Mark ended up being an instrumental person writing, writing scripture and really helping Paul at the end of his life. But there was this And then the other illustration of this was uh, there in, um, in Philippi, Eudius and Syntychus. I think that's, I pronounced them right. But they, had, they were two gals that were at each other's throats, as we would say. We don't know what they were fighting about. But he was, he was pleading with them. 
And he calls them, you know, sisters in the Lord. They contended for the faith. They were his fellow workers. But listen to his heartfelt urgency in this Philippians 4, 2. He says, I plead with Uthia and I plead with Syntyche to agree with each other in the Lord. I plead with you. These were women of faith, godly women. And I can hear him crying out, can't you all just get along? Come on. You can just hear him, please, look what's at stake. It doesn't make any sense for you all to be bitter and, eat and, and fussing and cussing and carrying on. Stop bickering. Here's the question. Has anybody here ever had an Uvia or a Syntyche in your life? No, never. <laughs> I have. Ooh. Listen. Harmony is no easier in the church today than it, it was back then. What are some of the things that are, we've talked about, we keep talking about this each week. What are the things that are dividing us as the church today? Name them. I got one right here. Don't want to go there, but you know what I'm talking about. Just something simple like this. Look at this. We can laugh about it, but politics. Used to be, I was talking to a friend of mine, pastor friend, used to be all we argued about with thought was theology. How do you baptize and when is Jesus coming back? And then she said, those were the good old days. <laughs> That's all we had to argue about. But the point is, we could take a lot of time discussing and with some sadness how we're divided today as the people of God at a time when we can least afford to be divided. Well, we can least afford to lack harmony among ourselves. And, and, and some of the things that we're divided about are ridiculous. What's at stake? People that we know and love and our families face a Christless eternity, an unimaginable eternity. People are looking for answers. People are wondering, why am I here? What's this all about? And we're arguing about, you know, what color we're going to do the carpet in the, in the church and then the church splits over it. I've heard of crazy stories, you know. Well, we're going to buy a John Deere tractor instead of a cadet cub, and so two of the deacons leave. I mean, crazy stuff. Now, what could we accomplish in the kingdom together if we put this foolishness aside and began to live in harmony? That's what we want to look at. But let's get a little bit personal. I've, every time I get up, every time I'm preparing this message, you know what? I have to begin applying it to myself. So it starts with me. And I'm telling you honestly, what about me? What about us? Are there people with whom we want nothing to do right now? And we talked about this couple of times. Is there still somebody that you just say, I struggle with that, to be honest. And God keeps convicting me of it. Sometimes there are people that we try to avoid at all costs. Why? Maybe God's got them in our lives for a reason. I'm sure he does. But the point is, just like harmony is not easy in music, it's not easy in the church. And we're called to live in harmony. So what do, what do we do when it comes to getting along with Miss Grumpy? You know any Miss Grumpies? Or Mr. Annoyings? Or this guy over here that talks too much? I'm one of those. Or, you know, just the nosy neighbor? We all got our stories. How are we doing? So this is Roman numeral two on your outline. Romans 12, 16, Paul commands us to live in harmony. And point A is, it's not complicated. Why do I say that? It's not complicated. Well, the fact of the matter is, the verse is too clear. It's right out there. Paul doesn't give any qualifiers. It's not ambiguous. There's no exceptions. There's no back door. Oh, if this happens, no. He says, live in harmony with each other. He doesn't say, if you have the same political views, or the same theological views, or the same 
whatever, whatever, you like the same food or you're from the same area of town. No, 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 none of that. He doesn't say those whose personal habits don't annoy you. No. He's saying it's live in harmony with one another. You know what it reminded me of? That old African-American gospel song. Hiss a me, hiss a me, hiss a me, oh Lord. You know that song? Standing in the need of prayer. Not my brother, not my sister, not my, you know, you know, whoever it is, my mother, father, neighbor, it's me. And so what I'm getting at, it's an implied implication here. It starts with us individually living in harmony. Oh, that person over there, not that person. It starts with me. It's me, Lord. you got to start with our own hearts. So here I am, Rick, or each one of us, leaders, volunteers, teachers, Whatever role we have in life, whatever it is, folks, this passage is for every single one of us. And it doesn't allow us to choose who we want to get along with. That's, that's what sometimes, that's why I said it's, it's, just, it's just plain. No back doors for us. So the question is presented, how is this possible? To live in harmony, particularly in the world that we live today. What, what, what are we supposed to do? Point C, what is Paul commanding? And that's the first thing we had to, what does this really mean? Point C, live in harmony. It's interesting, the live in harmony is uh, the New International Version. It's, it's um, their attempt at translating an idea in Greek rather than just a word. And the Greek, if you go to a Greek dictionary, you won't really find, and I found this out, you won't really find an equivalent to this harmony, this word harmony. It's, it's not the word, it's the concept. Point one under. So what does it mean? Literally, he says, I want you all to have the same mind together. I want you all to be like-minded. I don't mean have the same mind have the same opinion on everything, the same hobbies, like the same food, this having the same personalities. No, 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 no. He's calling us to have the same mindset and the same attitude, the same outlook in terms of the way we interact with one another. That's the point. That's what it means. The same mind. Roman numeral three. But what does this look like? Let's, let's put the cookies down here where we can get them. That's what I need. Let's look at a few other verses that flesh this out a little bit. What does it mean to live in harmony? Because these verses will point us in the direction that we need to go. So listen. Point A, 1 Peter 3, 8. He says, finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic as brothers and sisters. Be compassionate and humble. Notice there are two words, sympathy compassion. Now we're trying to figure out what it means to live in harmony. Sympathy, be sympathetic, and have compassion. Let's unpack this a second. Which means that the more we have these, the more we can live in harmony. We probably know in our heads, yeah, we should, we should have sympathy for folks. We should have compassion. We know it up here. But what happens? It doesn't get to our heart. And actually, this is really interesting in the Greek. It's talking about we need to have this understanding in our guts, in our innermost parts. And usually, I mean, it's really interesting. The word translated compassion comes literally, the word means from the spleen. To have compassion has to do with our, our guts. That maybe sound a little bit gross, but, but that's what it is. And we don't, I mean, that's why in, in old King James, they used to talk about the bowels of compassion. I remember the first time you hear that, you think, excuse me? You don't usually think of compassion in that way. But what they're saying is, in the ancients back in those days, they believed that our emotions came from inside us. That was, that was, that's why they used that word. So the translator is trying to, to, trying to communicate the Greek word. That's really what it comes down to. So look at it this way. When we are involved with somebody, we need to understand where they are coming from. 
we need to feel some emotion on the inside. And he's not talking about just a few kind words. Well, I'll pray for you. Yeah, I, 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 and you pray and you walk on. No, 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 no. And this is key. This is key. You know the old saying, put yourself in their shoes? It's even more than that. It's to genuinely try to feel the experience of other people. You know what the word empathy means, to empathize. It doesn't mean to take on all their problems. But the idea is that when we, and listen, everybody can listen to someone. We are not called to solve everybody's problems. We are not. But how hard is it to just sit down and just listen to someone? I'll confess something. I tend to be a fixer. Anybody, anybody a fixer in here? Yeah, okay, thank you. There's at least a few, calm, a few honest folks in here. No, I'm teasing. But if we really think about it, we see something that needs to be fixed. And, and sometimes it's hard for me to come to terms with that. Uh, my wife reminds me of it. Thank you, love. But the fact of the matter is, it, that's not what we're talking about. We're just talking about listening, being present, and trying to say, Lord, help me understand. Give me some compassion. Uh, let's go. This is really cool. I, I, I found this. And I thought, remember our music illustration? You know, there's a harmonic, and, and I'm sure that, that Swig and Doug know this, there's a harmonic phenomenon, phenomenon known as sympathetic resonance. Listen to this. I, I, maybe you learned this in, in, uh, in, in high school. I wasn't paying attention in high school, so I probably missed it. But the idea, this is the definition of it. Now bear with me. It's just when a, when a formerly passive string or vibratory body responds to external vibrations to which it has a harmonic likeness. What? And the illustration is... You have a tuning fork. You know what a tuning fork? You ever seen one of those? You go, bing! And then it will create with other forks next to it. And they'll start going, bing! It's crazy. Try it sometime. Or go, go Google it on, look it on Facebook, I mean, uh, YouTube. But it's really neat. So what's the point? If we are all tuned into Christ, bing! Then it can affect and create a harmonic response in others. I thought that was kind of cool. I had never thought about that. But, you know, it's a, it's a simple air, matter of physics, but it can also be applied to our situation. There's something about people suffering together, going through the same experiences that draw us together. I want to read. Most of us weren't around during World War II, but we know stories. We know stories about Listen to this. The history records that among the Londoners, and actually, when I was, before I, when I was traveling around in the early 70s, I went to work in London for a couple of summers, and I actually lived with a dear old man who lost both his wife and his daughter in the bombing of 1940, you know, when Britain stood alone, and the stories I heard, and uh, they were raw. I mean, he still had their old pictures right in front of him, but he lost them, and this was like 30-plus years later. Listen. Among Londoners who lived through the Nazi blitz, a large majority, this, listen to this, remember those times as the best days of their lives, and they recall them with fondness and nostalgia. Britain stood alone. Now, this is what happened was in 1940, in April of 1940, the Germans invaded, Paris fell. Britain was the only, everybody else had been conquered. Britain stood alone. She'd been forced to retreat on all sides. And at one point, listen, for uh, 52 straight nights, 1,500 planes went over and bombed Britain. 1,500. Night after night after night after night. And then came the V-1 rocket. I remember putting one of these together when I was a little kid, a little plastic thing. And it would go, and then the, the gas would give out, and it, would, it was a bomb. These people were going through the unimaginable fear. And this kept going. And one doctor who helped tend to the wounded in those days of fear and menace describes the strong bonds of community 
that develop. And he describes entire cities of people living underground. Maybe you've seen pictures of this. Having dinner, playing cards, laughing, nursing babies, sleeping on mats. Rich and poor were gathered together. Their political differences didn't matter. Where they lived in London didn't matter. The royal family visited among them. Above ground, they had lost everything, but below ground, they were one. I remember when we lived in Miami, this is kind of sad. We'd have a hurricane hit every so often, and that's the only time people got out and put their lawn chairs out. Well, the freezer is going to thaw everything out. We might as well have a cookout. It took hard times to bring us together. Do you all probably have some of the experiences yourselves when you're going through, maybe even right now, what's going on with us? You're feeling drawn, even though we can't see each other. One of the advantages of doing the virtual thing is that we're closer together as a staff. So the point is, sometimes in the most difficult times, they can draw us together. So. We're in a bomb shelter from the ravages of shattered sins. We're cloistered. We're, lock it. We're in lockdown in our own homes. But as people of God, listen, we as a church can offer refuge to others. We can reach out to people, our families, our neighbors, those that are in their own lockdown emotionally. I hate to say this, but I've talked to a friend of mine that's in the, in the therapy and I might have shared this with you in the therapy community, saying we will not feel the impact of 2020 for another 18 months to two years, the full impact of it. That's scary. But we have each other. We can, be, we can, we can start living and loving one another and reaching out. People living in fear, loneliness, depression, broken hearts, torn relationships. Let's offer them sanctuary. Let's be a church. Let's be families. Let's be individuals that reach out. And we can be all of this when we have sympathy and compassion. It can create a harmony. People are needing that right now. B, point B, another ingredient of living in harmony. And another way we can have the same mind is what Peter said in in 1 Peter 5, 5, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. This doesn't mean that we're just going you know, to put on a shirt, wear it for a little while, and then take it off. No, no, no. That's not what he's talking about. This, we're not talking about some kind of costume to make us look good. Clothe means to tie on four or five knots and tie it on, and it's there. Humility. And it, listen, you know, this does not come naturally to any of us. Because, truth be told, we're all full of ourselves. Me, 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 me. We've been talking about this each week. How easy it is. That's our sin nature to be about ourselves first. It's something we must put on. And we have to tie it on and we have to, as they say, cinch it in place. And it, came, it, it, contains, it contains the idea of being lowly, like Jesus humbling ourselves. He's calling us to have a proper estimate of ourselves, of knowing our sin, just like we pray each Sunday, but really putting that on and doing something with it. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 12, 3. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, this is Paul talking, I give each of you this warning. Listen, don't think better of yourselves than you really are. Be careful. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Wow, that's a good word. And here's something that I never thought about. I'm learning so much as I'm going through this. What is it that pride and low self-esteem have in common? Here's pride over here, and here's low self-esteem. You know what they have in common? It's all still focused on self if you're prideful, <laughs> look what I am. And if you have low self-esteem, whoa, 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 but it's all about self. And I understand that we struggle. We all can struggle with these issues. But it's still about me, my, mine. Humility isn't claiming first place for ourselves. I love this quote. I, I think uh, it was attributed to C.S. Lewis, but I think maybe looking at it, uh, 
Rick Warren in his popular book, The Purpose Driven Life. Maybe he came up with it, whatever. But this is it. This is an interesting quote. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Do you get that? It's not think, doing this. There's, listen, there's a lot of this in our culture today. Oh, I'm a, beating up. That's not it at all. That's not helpful. It's not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of ourselves less and putting others first. That's helpful for me. Um, this is a neat illustration. You know who Leonard Bernstein was? This is really cool. The great director and uh, musician and just, you know, few men were as gifted as he was in, in, in leading orchestras and stuff. And they said, well, look, what's the most difficult instrument to play? Have you all ever heard this? What is the most difficult interest, instrument Dr. Bernstein to play. And he thought for a minute. You know what he said? Second fiddle. He said, I can get plenty of first violinists. They're up here. But to find somebody who can play second fiddle with enthusiasm, now that's a problem. Because they've got to sit in the second chair. And if we have no second fiddle, guess what? There's not going to be any harmony. Think about that. How are we doing playing? And all of you are in, all of us are in situations where we have to take the lower place. What's been our attitude towards that? Just think about it. Ephesians 21, uh, 5.21 says, Submit one to another out of the reverence of Christ. And the biblical word for submit, this paints a beautiful picture. It means, the, it's, it's a military term, to line ourselves up under other people, or under other situations. That's what it means to submit. In the first century, this was uh, pretty common. It was a military term. And when soldiers willingly took up their positions and assumed their given roles, this was the word, we're to obey, we're under authority. That's where the term comes from. And it allowed an army to function efficiently and effectively. And, and this isn't forcing somebody into compliance. It's willingly saying, yes, I'll play second fiddle. I'm a follower. I don't have to be in charge. I don't have to have the last word. It's willingly placing ourselves in a lower position. We're talking about submission. How are we going to have harmony among ourselves and our families? Submitting. Putting the needs of others first. Being like Jesus. When we as followers of Christ willingly submit and line up ourselves, listen, we can begin to see harmony in the body. And boy, if there's anything that's needed right now today, that's what it is. Roman numeral five. So as we wrap it up, I want to draw our attention to one final pair of words, point A. The first comes in Roman 15, 7, where Paul says, accept one another, then just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. Let's look at this a second. There's a cause and effect thing. Think about it. Accept one another as Christ accepted us. Wow. Not accept if you feel like, no, 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 no. Here's our model. And how did he accept us? That's how we should accept our brothers and sisters in Christ. But it's not always the case. When we started our series, Love One Another, we were challenged to picture in our minds somebody difficult to love and accept. I'm still going through that in my mind. Here we are again, and it's worth asking, who am I? How can we not accept others after what Christ has forgiven us for? We, we talked about this during Easter, leading up to Easter, Palm Sunday and, and Good Friday. Look at what cost, look at what we forgive. How can we not forgive others based on the debt that we had that was forgiven? Who are we? And that's what Paul's saying here. And it's worth asking, is there somebody that we need to forgive? Somebody here, somebody in our families, whatever. And we saw this leading up to 
that week between the triumphal entry and the cross and the resurrection, all the, the lying and the scheming and the false charges and the abandonment and the cross and he pays for our sins. Jesus has made us brothers and sisters in Christ. And we want to make that reality moment by moment in our lives. And this, was, this was kind of an interesting little illustration. <clears throat> I heard about it. When I was a young Christian, I began to, in the 70s, uh, there was a real moving of God's spirit, and missionaries were going out to Papua New Guinea. It used to have another name. But there was this missionary who had some supplies, and he was sent out to take the supplies to some folks that were trying to reach a really savage Stone Age group there. This is really cool. It's true. So he was scared to death. I mean, these people eat one another. I mean, they were just, they were savage. And he's, so he's got these supplies and he's going through the, I'm sure praying with his backpack and everything, going through the little trail and guess what happens? comes around the bend and there's this guy with this garb that looked like he was some out of a movie and he's like uh oh hiss a me hiss a me you know he's ready and he says this is it and he was just frightened to death this is it he's thinking and then but but the interesting thing was the guy the the, the other person this this indigenous person was just as shocked when he saw him it's like Ooh. and then all of a sudden this guy had a spear and he went over and he in in the ground and he wrote something in the ground and the missionaries like and then he stood back and the guy went over there and you know what the guy had written in the ground a cross this is a true story and then the the missionary goes over there goes beside and does a cross and then they started laughing and they embraced each other these guys could not have been more different and they embraced one another because they were laying aside all of their baggage and the cultural stuff. Now why can't we do that? Think about it. Laying aside, I mean you can imagine the differences they had. And instead of drawing lines, but oftentimes we do, we draw lines in the sand. If you do this, I ain't got nothing to do with you. But that's not how they behaved. Lord, forgive us for our failure to love one another. And the second word appears, agree with one another. 1 Corinthians 1.10, I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another so that there may be no divisions among you. And, then that, and in that, that, you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. It's, it's easy to misunderstand what, what's happening here as we close. But the word agree means literally to speak the same thing. He's talking about things that we pro profess to be true. Paul's not saying we have to have the same opinion on everything, whether it's the ball team or, you know, the restaurant or those are silly things he's not talking about that some can favor you know contemporary music in church and i like hymns but he's not saying that we should all have the same preferences i like apple pie well i like you know peach cobbler that's not what he's talking about but since we all agree on these saving truths that we hold so dear we can be united that's what unites us our love for christ this is what was Paul was referring to in Ephesians 4. Be completely humble, gentle, patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope, and when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who was over all and through all. Listen, Paul and Barnabas would not have been able to overcome their differences if they had not applied this. They would work together again. We, we see that. And not only that, but Paul would work with John Mark. You know, he said, 
send John Mark, he's useful. John Mark is a fellow worker. So when Paul wrote to Timothy the second time, he said, get him. I'll leave you a, a really interesting story and then we'll close. But there's this story about these two little elderly ladies that were in a, a nursing home together. This is really sweet. And one of them was like paralyzed on the left-hand side. She's in her little wheelchair. And she was fine, uh, uh, fine here, but just couldn't. Yeah, but there was another little sweet lady, and guess what? She's paralyzed on the right side. And you, you know what I'm going to tell you, don't you? They loved music. These precious little, listen to this, this chokes me up when I think about it. These precious little ladies in the last days of their lives loved one another and they blessed the others. They would move them over, they'd get out of their chair, and they would sit at this piano and little lefty on this, and they would play music together. Can you imagine? They organized themselves and knew the hymns. She on the left-hand side, this one on the right-hand side. If they sat down at the piano, Margaret and Ruth, or whatever their name was, a resounding sound would come out of these women. Together, there was harmony. Folks, what unites us? What unites us is greater than what divides us. The one Lord that died for us, the one faith that saves us, the one baptism that joins us and fills us with his spirit, the one God whose plan, listen, and purpose is guiding the whole thing. This thing is headed in the direction of the restoration of all things. We are stewards of that. Those things are greater than all the things that we can allow to divide us. And we have many more reasons to get together and play music together. Let us commit to living in harmony with one another. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. It doesn't give us an out. You have created us to model what it means to live under the lordship of Christ. And my prayer for all of us is that we would take your word. We would search our hearts, Lord. You would convict us. You would empower us. You would enable us by your spirit in this unprecedented time, in our families, in our relationships, wherever we find ourselves, to live in harmony, especially here as the body of Christ among ourselves. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, it's exciting that we're, how long has it been since we've been able to? Oh, yeah. There we go. I hope I don't get fogged up so I can read. I wanted to just outline a little bit of what this is all about. I'm taking some notes here. The Lord's Supper is an act of worship taking the form of a ceremonial meal in which Christ's servants, that's us, we share bread and we share the cup to commemorate his death and to support, celebrate the new covenant relationship we have with him. Now, when you talk about practical application, folks, this is applying what we just heard. We are in a covenant with the creator and sustainer of the universe. And the Lord's Supper helps us visualize at what cost and what it looks like. So the Lord's Supper has a past reference. We're going to read this. A past reference to Christ's death. It has a present reference to our corporate participation in him through faith. And that includes living in harmony. And it has a future reference in that it is a pledge of his return. Folks, he's coming back. 
It encourages us, the faithful, in our daily walk and in our expectation, our anticipation. The service of worship in which Christians remember the suffering that Christ endured is a distinctive mark of the Christian faith all over the world. It's one of the sacraments. And we're able to enjoy it together again. And you're familiar with the passage. This is from Paul, 1 Corinthians 11. And he says, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. In the night that when Christ was betrayed, he took bread. And after he had broken it, giving thanks, he said, this is my body that is broken for you. Every time you do this, every time you eat it, you do so in remembrance of me. That's his broken body. Then, it says he took the cup. And he said, in the same manner, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The bread. And his blood. And then he goes on to say. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So we're going to have an opportunity to share. John, I think, is going to be with me. We're going to have an opportunity to share together. And so we have bread and we're going to go row by row no, pew, by pew. pew by pew yes sir all righty bread if you could take it and we're going to take it back to our seats mm -hmm. yeah and then for those that want to if you feel more comfortable with that have you seen these kind of cool just whoosh, got a little wafer in there same deal remember it's not the form it's the substance so we invite you to He'll drop the bread in our hand. Yeah. With the tongue. With the tongue. Yep. Gotcha. See, I ain't touched nothing. <laughs> Who's first? There it is. We got some awesome people leading this church, just so you know. The, bo the body of Christ broken for you. body of Christ broken for you. There you go. Body of Christ broken for you. broken body for you to pray.
Christ's body broken for you. Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is the new covenant in my blood. My blood poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
Thank you. Let's receive the benediction of the Lord. This is from the book of Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory, majesty, dominion, power, both now and forevermore. Amen. Be safe. Good to see everybody.